Good evening. This is Tuesday, October 13th, 2020 meeting of the Town of Berlin Planning Board. As a preliminary matter, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some of the attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you. The bedazzled Michael Jackson t-shirt you decided to buy on your last vacation. And anything else you intend to or not sh screen share on your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured and recorded forever and ever and ever, and may possibly wind up as a TikTok video to be shared amongst your friends and neighbors. This is Tom Sanford, Chair of the Planning Board. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me prior to me calling the meeting to order. Planning Board members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Carolyn McDonald. Here. Timothy Wheeler. Here. Jay Teach. Here. Tom Sanford. Here. Anticipated speakers will be, um, there's nobody on right now, so we'll do that when they come on. A quorum of the board is present, and I call this meeting to order at 7.31 p.m. Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. This is an open meeting of the planning board to be conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. Specifically, information and general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public can be found on the Town of Berlin website. The governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting laws to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location and allows and encourages us to participate remotely. For this meeting, the planning board is convening using the Zoom platform as posted on the agenda, which includes links for the public to join in this meeting. Meeting ground rules. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I'll invite each board member by name to provide comment, questions, penetrating insights, and or motions. Please hold all your insights till your name is called. Board members and speakers on the agenda, please remember to mute your microphone or telephone computer when you're not speaking. Please speak clearly and accurately so minutes can be recorded. For, the, for any re, uh, response, please wait until you are yielded the floor and state your name before speaking. If a board member wishes to engage in conversation with another board member, please do so through me to avoid multiple conversations at the same time. Lastly, please note that each vote in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call board vote. Thank you all for your understanding and cooperation. So, um, meetings call to order. I will entertain a motion that we accept the minutes for as recorded from the planning board meeting dated 9-22-2020. So moved, Tim Wheeler. Second. I have a motion and a second in discussion. Hearing none, unfortunately I have to, was there a comment? No. Hearing none, I'll have to ask you to vote by roll call. Uh, Jay Teach. Aye. Tim Wheeler. Aye. Carolyn McDonald. Aye. Tom Sanford, aye. Okay, unanimously accepted the motion uh, to accept the meetings as recorded last month. Okay, so on the agenda, um, we have the River Ridge people coming at eight o'clock to continue their discussions with us. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about the affordable housing uh, monitoring services and then other timely items. But in the meantime, I figured for the first half hour, there's a couple of housekeeping things that I would like to get done. And then I didn't know whether we wanted to discuss some of the possible um, Riverbridge warrant articles that were written and sent around for everybody's consideration. Because there's some things in there that, I don't know, we need to probably so figure out where we want to go. Chris, Chris is a participant now. Oh, cool. And, uh, but I think they, when they speak at eight, they may discuss their slim down uh, okay. anticipated possibilities. So 
Um, you can hold on that then. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds great. Uh, good. Uh, so first housekeeping item. Um, I was asked to, by the town accountant to sign again, these uh, accounts, the two accounts that we have, our main accounts. But one of the items that had come up in the account was there was an expenditure for printing of the bylaws for $633, which I thought was a lot of money. Was it more copies than usual? Was it? I don't know, and it doesn't say. And we didn't fill out a warrant ourselves to do that. It was just charged to our account. Now they've done that in the past. They've charged, you know, they've printed um, bylaws and stuff like that. But and then I, they charge for those, right? Uh, no, not anymore. Oh, oh, because they're available online. They they sell the paper copies, don't they? they yeah. I don't. Do they sell? They must sell them. Yeah. Yeah. Them to it, yeah. Where, where does that money go? It's supposed to go back to our account. Hmm. What? Maybe right. not. Our, our account, I don't think, is revolving. So I think it's not. Okay. Goes into a general. You just fund. expend it, and it goes to a general fund, or whatever. All right. Well, I mean, I was just sort of surprised that the number was so high, and I, I and you know. Well, did did they have to print twice? I mean, is that that should be just one printing though, right? It says uh, printing of bylaws, but it doesn't, Article 48, printing of bylaws, but it doesn't give me a quantity or any reference or anything else, just the a, a $633 was debited to our account. Well, if, if it happened on two occasions, which... It's only one line item, so I'm not sure if they... Yeah, there's, I mean, it's one line item for like $2,000 for printing, but if she's saying that that six hundred and something dollars was deducted over the course of the year, and we modified the bylaws for a special town meeting in an annual. I mean, I'm trying to recall, but it's possible that it's, you know, it could be two three hundred and twenty dollar. Um, could be, and and if if you did, uh, if she did fifty copies at a crack, at eight dollars a copy, you come pretty you know you, i don't know so do you want to ask for further ex for i mean is this i, I can right i, can I mean i don't know that there's no approval right there's nothing right. here <laughs> so so that was that was my my you know am i i'm being asked to um verify that these accounts are correct and i yeah. see this expenditure in here and i'm like ah, i don't know maybe it is correct i i don't know I mean, uh, right. the other one there's two accounts and the other one is just the uh there's nothing in nothing went in nothing went out so it stayed the same they're static so did that come out of the annual budget or a different account it's come it comes out of our our um our um planning board account the main account so we have we have an expense account and then we have a, a line item for printing so those would be the two you may be looking at. This just says an allocated summary of expenditures. Allocated summary expenditure ledger. Eloise will know how much she spent. What? Eloise will know how much she spent. All right, I can I only email Eloise and ask her how much she spent on it. See if I can dig it out. Okay. The other thing we got was um, the you can't even see it. The, the CMRPC um, asking us for our delegates and alternates. Now you had asked the the uh, Tim uh, said that you would, would do the primary. So the question was: Is the uh, board of selectmen didn't want to do? The alternate they wanted to revert back to us right yeah they so said if somebody wants to be alternate that'd be great so mm -hmm. we need to find out whether somebody wants to volunteer to be alternate mm, did i volunteer for that i thought i might have you seemed interested when i watched you this <laughs> afternoon did you, did you like this? Do it? <laughs> i mean i can fill it out and put your name in 
Sure. All right. It's just like a free lunch, isn't it, Tim? <laughs> I don't see anywhere in the description a free lunch. They give us cookie cookies and milk. Are they good cookies? Uh, Keebler, you know. <laughs> you have to be a resident of Berlin. That's about it. Check that box. You can check that box. All right. All right, I'll put those both in. You've enjoyed going when you've gone, Jay, so. Yeah, they've been great meetings, actually. Yeah. I have liked it. And anybody can go. I mean, we can drag these other people along, too, sometimes. If That's they true. Yep. Yeah. We should all go sometime, have cookies and milk together. Yep. <laughs> when they're actually in person again. Yeah. Now you just have to have cookies at home. That's right. That's what we've done the last few times. You had to bring your own, so. But I will make an effort to send you the notice when they send out the quarterly meetings, because those are the, they do four quarterly meetings. And um, like Jay said, sometimes they're pretty interesting. Okay, so that will take care of that. Um, the other thing that we had that showed up in our mailbox um, is the application for, or the, um, not an application, but the uh, Excel spreadsheet and what have you for another sign at Highland Commons. And this is for Acton Medical Associates. So oh, they're yeah. down near where Emerson is hmm. in that area. So um, I did take, take a quick look through, um, I mean, there's a ream of paper here. Um, and it looks like it fits within the guidelines of what we've done and all the other stuff. So it's actually, you know, okay. Um, I don't know how everybody feels about wanting to see the physical paper and all this. It came as paper, so the only way we could get it around is either drive it around or scan it and see it or take my word that it matches up. So or get them to send us an electronic version. We could do that. It probably was electronic and they made it paper to send it to us. They probably did because it was an XL. So chances are, mm -hmm. yes. The, uh, the renderings were probably done, probably CAD, because there's some uh, renderings on also of, of of what it's supposed to look like. But they they follow the same format as what they've done on all the other ones. So uh, I don't know that we, we really want to review it. Like we can delay the action or we can take an action tonight if you want. I trust that you know what you're doing. I have confidence in you, Tom. There's one lone dissenter in amongst us. <laughs> Who was the uh, <laughs> what? Who's, who's the proponent, Tom? Who gave, who filed the application? This was filed through Benderson themselves. Okay. So, um, uh, Bigalotti, Bigal James Bigalotti, he's been in to see us before. Um, he's their uh, director of Right to Build, Northeast USA. I just spell his name so I don't spell it wrong. Oh, okay. It's James. Still the second part. <laughs> yep. B O G L I O L I. Oh, there's no T's in there then, right? Nope. Okay. And it's for Acton Medical Associates. Yeah, I'm glad they're coming. That's great. So if we're okay with this, I entertain um, a motion. Uh, Tim Wheeler will move that we accept the sign layout by Acton, Associ Acton Associates. It's sent by Benderson. Acton Medical. On by, by Benderson on behalf of Acton Medical. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, here's like a good tenant. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how much space they're taking. If they're taking the uh, space that's next to the urgent care, so it's one storefront wide. Oh, I thought it was two, huh? Uh, the sign only covers one, but maybe they are taking another space. Yeah. The sign is only on one, so it's right. If you're looking at the elevation, it's um, you got five below, and then you have the one that has the the pop up that they, sometimes they have the Halloween stuff that's in there, the temporary, and then Acton Medical will be next, and then Urgent Care is on the very end. Cool. So their, their storefront is basically double the size of um, the urgent care, you know, in terms of overall width. So mm. it's a fairly decent sized box. Good. All right. So we need a roll call vote, unfortunately. Um, let's mix it up. Carolyn McDonald. Aye. Timothy Wheeler. Aye. Jay Teach. Aye. Tom Sanford. Aye. So carries by unanimous vote. So what I'll do is I'll send a little note to the building inspector. I'll, that's what I did the last time and he was fine with how we did it. So this formally allows him to approve it. What are we doing for time? We still have 15 minutes before uh, the other guys come on. Do you think it's uh, we can get the discussion of um, the affordable housing monitoring done. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, I didn't print out the paper. So um, from what I know, there's a, a service um, or actually it's a like a, a group of communities, right? And I think Hudson takes the lead on it, but there's other um, players that are in it like Stowe and some of the other smaller players. And we can join, there's a fee to join obviously. And then they will do the monitoring, the, um, um, the requirements, the lotteries, all of the things that go along with it. And it was something that was sent to us for consideration from Margaret um, for us to look at that she ferreted it out. So, I mean, on the surface, it sounds like a great idea to be able to do this. What's the fee? Um, it's it's a it's a percentage of, I think it's percentage of population. There's a, there's a scale anyways. So Oz, I guess Oz would be like forty some one hundred dollars. So it's not like it's gobs of money, but it's way cheaper than if we had to get somebody to get up to speed and do that. That would just work in concert with the housing partnership, right? Uh, that's the way I'd understand it, and. Okay. The, the, the hope would be, if we investigate this more, that they might act as an agent on our behalf right. if a property were to come up for sale. Okay. And, and if we, I don't know if they've done this in other towns, but if, since the housing partnership has funds and we'll be getting CPA money that goes to housing, if they could, if we were to, to risk losing a unit, they could acquire it and then we could rent it until such time came that the market would allow us to sell it again and recoup the funds and maybe throw in a little extra to sweeten the deal so you could help somebody meet the requirement, you know. But then instead of losing units, we'd we'd maintain what we've got. I mean, this notion of losing units doesn't make any sense. No, we've, we've worked, worked too hard. hard. Yeah. <clears throat> well, absolutely. If there is the ability to rent in situations like that, that would be helpful. Well, the other thing too is, is they looked at, from what I saw, they do all the reporting and all of this stuff that, you know, volunteers would have to do for our, our on our side, and sometimes that's, um, you know, I would think overwhelming <laughs> for some people, um, but just because of the, the the amount of paperwork that needs to be done, you know, and if they're doing it for other other towns, they're probably more efficient at it than a one-off. Right. What's the name of the organization again? Um, it's called Af Affordable Housing Monitoring Services. It's Harvard. 
Harvard, Lancaster, Bolton, Stowe, Hudson, maybe Maynard. I don't. It, I didn't think Maynard was up there. But it's a it's a nice cluster that's closely right. associated to us, so it's sort of a no brainer, you know. So do, what do we do? We have to take any action on it, or do we offer our support, or? Well, I think if we offered our support, that would be fine. They, we have to apply to them and then they have to vote to accept us, I guess, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we cross our fingers, you know, but I would think that looking at us, they'd say this isn't a high maintenance no. town compared to some. I mean, then, of course, we got more units than a lot of these other towns that are bigger than us. So. What does it say about the pricing, Tom? Is it specific? In terms of what? What the what's stock? It, what's it cost us? Oh, it's like a sliding scale. And I don't know yeah. whether it's based on population. Or, I didn't read it closely enough. Oh, um, okay. But there is a, there's a, like a sliding scale or a scale. And I believe I thought it was on population. <laughs> OK. Is that something you can send around? We all got it. We did? The email yeah. was sent around. You didn't get it? No. Oh, I got, maybe I didn't understand what it was. Did it come today or yesterday? No, it came last week or almost two weeks ago now. Oh, all right. That's well, from Margaret? Yep. I missed it. Hmm. I don't have it. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it and I'll attach it to the minutes. If you do find it, Jay, can you forward it? Sure. That would be great. Thank you. I think I've got it and I'm going to send it to everybody. Okay. I reached out to DHCD last week. Do you want me to read this? Yes, please. Uh, I reached out to, this is from Margaret, to request information on collaboratives or other partnerships in Massachusetts that assist municipalities with protecting their SHI units. That's subsidized housing inventory. They responded that there are three such collaborations in the state, the nearest being ASABIT Regional Housing Consortium, um, frequently known as Metro West Regional Housing Consultant, which is comprised of the towns of Hudson, which is the lead municipality, Bolton, Foxborough, Littleton, Stowe, Lancaster, Harvard, and the Devons Enterprise Commission and Mass Development Devons. These municipalities and Devons work with Metro West Collaborative Development on overall inventory compliance, monitoring, and other services through an intermunicipal agreement connected with Hudson after learning of this consortium and was provided a price proposal showing the estimated fees to be paid by members in fiscal 21. Um, Hudson further informed me that the town is not required to have established an affordable housing trust fund under Massachusetts general law in order to join or remain a member and uh, price proposals and other relevant documents are attached. We are currently within the allowable timeline to become a member effective July 1st, 2021. If Berlin is interested in petitioning to join Hudson as the lead municipality would consult with Metro West CD and consortium members regarding the ability to add Berlin. I introduced this opportunity to select board at Monday meeting. Now I request that the housing partnership and planning board discuss it as soon as practicable so the town can explore it further with Metro West. Look forward to hearing back from you. Um, and I will forward this to everyone because she's got three attachments. Awesome. Yeah, so Metro West Collaborative Development came up. Um, I think it looks good. It's on its way, I hope. <laughs> flying through the air as we speak. Yeah, flutter, flutter. <laughs> and 
presently Bolton pays forty six hundred, Boxbro eighty, well eight thousand, Hudson eighty four, Littleton thirty six, Stowe sixty nine, Devons twenty nine, Harvard thirty three, Lancaster fifty four. And it, it breaks it down into local support, regional activities and monitoring, and then they have numbers. So it looks like it may be driven to some degree by, yeah, it looks like it's driven by um, unit, units that are uh, monitored. And well, they, there was a proposal in there, right? Pardon? Attachment, one of the attachments is a proposal. Um, that's the price proposal from May 19, 2020 to those member towns. Okay. How many units do we have in total in town? We're going to have 205, I think. 200. We've got 100. We had 119 and we've added 84. So, um, we may have lost a few of the 119. So we're right around 200. And we need, I assume that with the census, if we were at um, 1200, approximately 1200 housing units, we've probably added with the apartments and some 40 Bs and the increase at uh, Northbrook two. I think we're going to be somewhere around 1,600 units, and we'd have we'd have 200 affordable units, which means we could essentially have 2,000 units. So we'd be 400 units to the good. I mean, you know, we could add 400 additional housing units if we kept the affordable units we've got. Right. So, um, if these numbers on the price proposal. Uh, so Boxborough has 107. So we're just under twice that and they pay $8,000. So if it's based on the number of units, then we're looking at 16 grand. Yeah, they may be happy to have us. Yeah. <laughs> what is Hudson? What is Hudson? Did you see that? Hudson has 112. That's why I'm not totally sure this is number of units. That doesn't if it was 112, had, it, and they were like 80 some odd uh, hundred dollars. Yeah, 8,400. But they can't have 112 units. They got to have more than that. They've got to have more than that. There's 112 up at the you know thing that's the Yarra built. On of course, the old, the old, uh, <laughs> you mean Street. Simmer Gardens? Yeah. Well, although you know your SHI will say you've got X number of units. If they're apartments, then they're counted, but they're not affordable. So I wonder if they monitor the affordable units of that. Like in our case with Riverbridge, it's 84 units that we get credit for, but there's only 21 that are really affordable. So if they're only monitoring those 21. Right. Um, there, it may very well be lower numbers in Hudson's case, where they've got a lot of apartments that make up maybe their um, affordable stock. Right. Could be. So I don't know. We'll find out. But I move that we, you want a motion that says we, uh, yes, please. We, we encourage the selectmen and the town administrator to pursue this with vigor and determination. You got that, Jay? Vigor and determination. Yes. Yeah. I'll second that, especially the vigor. Yeah. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I will take a roll call vote again. Uh, Jay Teach. Aye. Carolyn McDonald. Aye. Uh, Timothy Wheeler. Aye. And Tom Sanford, aye. So we voted uh, unanimously to encourage with emphasis on bigger and determination to pursue this endeavor. 
Cool. All right. Great. I think that'll help out. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it's now 8 p.m. So we're just in time for our Riverbridge friends. Um, I don't know how. how so Leanne can let them in. And Leanne, then Leanne can promote them. Leanne, okay. Leanne uh, yes. Chris, Chris wants to share his screen with some documents with us. Is that, that's possible, I guess. Yeah, huh? he should have that capability. I have um, John Burns, Christopher Sene, and Alexander Sene, and I'll move them up to panelists. Hi, Chris. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. And is everybody um, that's going to be, yes? Everybody? Yeah, Alexander Senny is my nephew, Matt's, Matt's son. Here's Matt. Okay. Good evening. Hello, Matt. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good, good. Um, so, we, in order to make this legal, I have to um, have a real quick um script that we are doing this is through zoom platform and what have you so um uh, please note this meeting is being recorded um attendees are participating by video conference um anything that you say screen share or what have you will be captured and recorded uh, we opened the meeting earlier uh the uh planning board members were roll called in um, any of the uh, actions that the board will take will be by roll call vote. Uh, if a speaker is speaking, um, please wait until the floor is yielded to you. Speak clearly so that the accurate minutes can be uh, captured and recorded. Um, any response, please wait until you yield to the floor. If a board member wishes to engage in conversation, uh, please do so through the chair so that we can keep uh, multiple conversations um, at, at, a, at a minimum so that we can ensure that we get accurate minutes of the meeting. So welcome back, guys. You guys had presented the last time. You asked for an opportunity to come back and show us some stuff. We had asked you for some things if you could get it ready in time. Uh, so if um, what I'll do is I'll yield the floor to Chris. Chris, you can kind of give us an overview of what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and then um, we can go from there. How's that? Good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're glad to be back. Uh, with me tonight is my brother, Matt, my partner at Riverbridge, and John Burns, who is the contract purchaser of Lot 9B. That's the lot that stretches from the, the Village Cafe to the, the Growing Room Daycare Center. And uh, we have two items on the agenda tonight. Uh, the first is to talk about Lot 9B and our new vision for it, which is instead of building retail, which we have had trouble attracting, building 29 two-bedroom townhomes. And uh, John is, is a developer of townhomes, and we've entered into a contract which is contingent upon uh, getting all necessary approvals, including a town meeting vote. Uh, so we would like to take you through a site plan and some elevations. Uh, and I'd like John to do that. Uh, before we do that, I'd just like to say that we also asked for an opportunity to, to discuss with your board uh, a list of potential items for warrant articles at the next two town meetings, the winter special town meeting and the spring annual town meeting. And the reason we'd like to, to get a, a good earnest discussion going about these items is that Matt and I are, are beginning to try to plan our exit from being the developers of Riverbridge. We've built uh, much of the project, we and, and partners we've brought into, into, the, into the Riverbridge project. We have our lot 9B left, which is 3.7 acres. And across the street in front of the hotel, we still have uh, the small parcel that could accommodate a 5,000 square foot restaurant or restaurant and retail. 
So we're nearing the completion of our development phase. We, we want to be part of this community for a long, long time. We own interest in four of the properties and we have no intention of uh, parting with those. This, they really represent the, the fruit of the work we've put in over the last 11 years. If we do appear at the December town meeting, that would be 11 years after uh, the, the town gave us the opportunity to build River Bridge. That was December 2nd, 2009. Uh, when the overlay zone was approved. So because John is here, and because I think the, the most important feature of everything on the list that, that's been circulated of, of what we view as the benefits of River Bridge, but also the things we would like to ask for at the next two town, meeting, town meetings, um, I'd like to turn it over to John and have him share with the board and the public who are watching what we now think would be a wonderful way to complete the development of the east side of River Road West, uh, situated right in front of the, uh, the Rockwell apartments. So I'll turn it over to John. John does have some files that he can put up on the screen if uh, that can be coordinated. John? Thank you, Chris. I assume everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Chris and planning board members. And I think last time, I don't think Carolyn was present, but I had give, gave somewhat of an introductory to the background of our company and what we've done and so forth. So rather than go through that, if Carolyn has any particular questions during that, please feel free to ask me those or go back over anything. But we we're going to use this uh, presentation this evening to show you essentially what the layout for the um, 29 proposed units are what the buildings look like. So uh, if you could bear with me a bit, this is my um, first time doing this. So um, if you will, let me just come back here. So I want to share my screen with you. Um, here's, um, <clears throat> hopefully you're seeing a plan down at the bottom. It's titled River Bridge Townhomes 29 Units. Is everybody seeing that? Not yet, John. I think you might have to not only select the file you want us to see, but then press share, share screen. Okay. Okay, where am I? Um, bear with me. So Chris, I asked you to be my backup. Do you mind showing that when I've tried, I guess I... I think up near the top, you have a, a tab that might get you to your document. I do. I, <clears throat> I actually had the document. I could see it. It's just, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, okay, let me just see here. Hopefully, can everybody see that one now? Yes, now we can see it. Thank you. Again, bear with me. I, I'm better at developing and building homes than I am at Zoom. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so anyways, <clears throat> essentially, as you can see up top here, you see the first uh, rotary, and then you see the second one down here. <clears throat> which is, you know, which is River Road West. And then you see the um, existing entrance here, Bassett Road, you see the uh, retail store. So we were proposing to come in here. We have approximately 10 spaces um, right in this area here. You come in, there's a duplex. And then we have a, <clears throat> a fourplex, a sixplex, um, and two triplexes here off of this road. And then we come down here, we have the six townhomes and another five. And here's the existing parking, if you will, for the, um, the daycare center, which is located over in here. Approximately in this location right here <clears throat> is where you will see the um, existing white building. And back here, you'll see where the, um, scrolling across the three existing uh, buildings, the apartments that are there, followed by the other ones that are down here that are off the screen. So <clears throat> this is what we're proposing to build on there. Um, in terms of the uh, buildings themselves, I just, uh, hopefully let me know when you can see that screen, the proposed elevation, if everybody can see those. <laughs> so this obviously would be the front. And um, obviously we won't have blue windows, but those were just to highlight those so you could see them. Uh, right here, what is not prominent, uh, unfortunately in the smaller screen is, these are white balusters. And this, my thought was that, you know, Berlin is somewhat New England 
and you know try to keep up the style and so forth and not go too extreme. So what we're proposing for these front porches is, and they're not at highlighted that much, the white ballast is the reason being is that behind here, this area is, um, we're putting stone on the bottom. And you can see we have shutters and we have a, <clears throat> a door, you know, going in here. And then the garage doors, you can see we try to do a, a nice style garage door. Um, you can see the rear elevation here on the back. Each one will have a slider going on to like a patio. We're doing patios instead of decks. Um, I just think they don't stick out as much and um, they've gone over much better in our other developments. Here are some of the side elevations. And <clears throat> this here is um, on the ends of each building. Is, um, I've room for the fire suppression system, commonly known as sprinklers, you know, that we have on the ends of the buildings. So this is essentially what the style of the uh, buildings will look like. In terms of the floor plans, you know, we have these floor plans that are um, shown. So what you're looking at right now is the first floor. <coughs> Excuse me, each one will have a one car garage. And you can see here's the porch that we have out front that I was trying to explain. The ballasts will be right here, followed by the stone that's uh, against here on the, this portion of the home. So you basically walk in the front door, there's a closet, there's a half bath. This is the uh, area to go either upstairs or downstairs. By the way, all these are going to be on grade due to the existing topography out there. And then we have the kitchen up in this area here with an eating area, followed by a living area. And then when, uh, by the way, they're all the same style units uh, throughout. We, we just chose a triplex on here just for showing you. And then, so when you saw those, a duplex, a triplex, or a fourplex, they're all going to be the same floor plan, but it would just um, add an additional unit or subtract or whatever the case it is on there. Here's the uh, upstairs floor plan, as you can see. When you come up the stairs here, there's an open area. Um, there's a <clears throat> common bath that's up here uh, off of this, uh, used by bedroom number two right here, washer and dryer, and then you enter the master suite which is in here, the closet and the master bath. And that's essentially it. We're trying to see if we can market these towards a, um, maybe a first time home buyer or somebody leaving like an apartment or somebody um, that's essentially looking for something in the, I hate to say it, more affordable range these days because as a developer, it's been very difficult this year with, we've uh, endured some substantial cost increases in materials. So that, that's, that's our um, objective right now is to go towards like first time home buyers. And um, that's essentially it. I could expand on any of that or all of that. If you'd like to go back to any particular plan. Can you go back to the, um... So the, uh, uh, I guess it was the, not that one. Well, I guess it does step in and out. That one. So, yeah, okay. Front elevations and then the rear elevations. Okay. So the front is on top. Yep, yep. I get it. I was just from from these elevations. You don't get that um, stepping uh, that you do on the floor plan. So, what's the peak height of the roof, roughly? Um, <clears throat> the peak height of the roof is uh, let's see, uh, 10, 18. Probably in the 28, 29 foot range. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, age 16, uh, around 27 feet. I, I could get that exact um, measurement for you, but it's, I believe you have a 35 foot height requirement and uh, our limit date. And uh, we're not going to be anywhere near that. Can you go back to the site plan? Sure. 
getting better at this, huh? I did. Yeah. So there's, there's going to be from the road edge to the back, there's some screening, obviously, that's there. And then um, the depth of that lot to where the, um, the new apartments are allows for a roadway into the complex and some treescaping. Um, We just, I'm just, the only, I, I, the, where I'm going with this thought process is we were uh, originally when we envisioned this, uh, as I had mentioned on the last meeting, um, the, the apartments that were in behind was supposed to be, you know, softly screened by story, story and a half retail space in the front, um, closer to the road to mimic the, um, you know, the, a, a village, um, you know, look and feel. And these are going to be, you know, almost the height of, won't be the height of the three stories, but, you know, a good two and a half stories tall. Um, so that impact that we have is going to be a little different than what we originally envisioned. Um, I know the topography where the, where the um, apartments are sort of is down a little bit. So it sort of softens. So like if you come over the hill as you're heading down towards the rotary and you look across there, you don't see their height of those roofs sticking up above the daycare or anything else. I mean, you, the presence is there, but it, it's, it's not, um, I guess it's be okay if it's hidden in behind there. I just don't want the sense that you're driving down River Road uh, west and you got a real tall structure that's, you know, not <coughs> like it's more urban. Um, One of the um, challenges that we had was the proximity to the major road and you got it. Yep. You know, we wanted to put some screening out here, you know, so that people wouldn't see them. So I don't know how much of you that you'll see when you're actually driving by here of the buildings themselves, you're probably going to see more of the second floor than you are the first. Right. I was one to, again, try to hide it, and two, to give some of these people some privacy, because here's the front, say, and if this particular building, and these are like the back, if you will, where their patios are. Sure. So I felt it was important to give the screening, you know, in here, <clears throat> and give more of like a, a rural feel, feel, if you like, on there. In terms of you know, seeing these buildings here, um, this will screen them somewhat, but if you're back over here in the rotary, I don't know how much of that actually is going to screen. Right, and, and, that, and right now, when you're back on the other side of the rotary, uh, and you're looking across, and you see the three-story buildings that are exist there now, um, they're not appreciably, they're, they're a little bit higher than the daycare, but they don't jump out at you as these large units that are stuck in the middle of a field. And, and I think part of that is, you know, the Olive Boyd and the Sennies and um, your Rockwell group kind of worked close together to, to, you know, get the most bang for the buck, but don't create this, you know, a, a large, you know, feel to that, that whole, you know, we're, we're definitely smushing everything into a small, area the site was a lot bigger but it was very important to preserve a lot of the open views and open spaces and things like that and uh, you know i'm not saying that i'm opposed to the heights of this i understand the economics of this and you have to get it to 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 um be marketable um i just want to make sure that what we're being asked to buy into that we're going in it with open eyes because it's different than what we originally envisioned for this whole site, you know, numerous years ago. I mean, it's morphed and it's twisted in its turn, but um, for the most part, I think that we've done a fair job um, with what people's expectations are. Um, if I could, I did relay your comments. <clears throat> we've noticed down here we're using Waterman Design and they've been involved with the complete development. I did share your comments with them, and that's probably why they did the landscaping. And, you know, we uh, this is more of coming back, all right? This is what we're thinking to get feedback from the board, and I'll continue to express your comments to uh, Carolyn, is the person that's um, there constantly. 
right? One, one thing that we're going to get a little bit of pushback is on the uh, <coughs> three, three unit townhouses that get pushed towards the existing. Um, I believe the fire department's going to want some sort of way behind there in case there's something that gets going between the two two units um, in terms of from, from a firefighting standpoint. I know that they were very sensitive to the buildings in the back and I'm just envisioning this is gonna be one of the things they're gonna comment on. Not that we can, you know, I mean, we won't solve it tonight, but it may come up. Um, one, can, can you, maybe Chris wants to do this, but we've, we've uh, we're looking at a modification to Bassett Road and I think, there ought to be some explanation on that so we all understand. Sure, <clears throat> I'm happy to address that. First, um, the, the walkway between the two different residential projects is not just a walkway, but it, it is prepared to handle firefighting equipment. This was designed so that it's actually a road, but then landscaped with a walkway on it. The, those two triplexes do look awfully close to that emergency roadway. So we will have to take a look at, we will have to take a look at that. Uh, you're right, uh, Tim, Bassett Road was actually designed to be a U-shaped road that came in near the cafe and the small roundabout and came straight, straight uh, east to the treatment plant and then turned a corner and came along the eastern edge of the, the Rockwell and then turned west and came all the way back out to River Road West. And it's only recently that we thought about making this break in the road, preserving Newsom Road, which comes around near the daycare center and will come all the way through Lot 9B. Um, and we did review this with the Rockwell, an NRP group and they gave us their blessing. They have two uh, means of access and egress from the apartment project, Tyler Road behind the daycare center and Bassett Road. And they're pretty comfortable understanding that most of their residents are gonna wanna come out Bassett Road near the roundabout because that allows them to turn left and go over to 290. And even if you connected the, the more northerly section of Bassett Road, uh, folks coming out of the residential area would have to turn right and go around the larger rotary before they can get to, to 290. So we, we were very sure between two weeks ago and tonight to talk with NRP Group and the Rockwell about would they be okay if Bassett Road didn't go through but actually served more as a, an entrance into this townhome um, community, but also having the, right, the ability to come around on Newsom Road and, and connect to the apartments that way as well. And they were fine with it. Um, it's really your call because this is a, a modification of the existing site plan. And so we don't yet know what your feelings are about it, but there does seem to be good opportunities for access um, and egress. So we thought it would give a stronger sense of community to the townhome project here if it didn't go all the way through. But we're open to, to hearing your view on this as well. He must be muted. Oh, did you hear me? No, he, he heard you. I'm being I'm being a wise guy. <laughs> okay, because I'll go through that again. <laughs> no, 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 no. If it helps on this question, this is Matt. I think you can hear me. Yes. Uh, I'm meeting with uh, both the fire chief and the police chief tomorrow just to review this plan and get their input which we'll share with you at subsequent emails or another meeting. But I'm meeting with both of them tomorrow. I would have met with them earlier, but of course we probably, I only got the design yesterday. Sure. So I'll be with them both at the same time tomorrow afternoon. No, 
I know that there may be a sense of disappointment that we haven't succeeded in bringing in more retail, which, which was the, the plan for this lot 9B. As you know, the, the Pure Hockey Building sat vacant right, right across the, the rotary from this for more than seven years. And there's other vacant retail space in the area. And I think we, you know, we have brought 100,000 square foot feet of commercial to date. And certainly the parcel in front of the hotel will be further retail. That has been site plan approved for restaurant and retail. I think what's happening here and what will be the result is that the east side of River Road West will be a residential community made up of two different types of housing. Um, you'll have the daycare center and you'll have the cafe there. And I think it will look quite handsome as you, as you drive through uh, River Road West in, in either direction. I think these different housing models can, can be made to, to blend together pretty well. And I'm not sure it's even going to ultimately be noticeable that these are two different projects. I think what will be clear is that the town chose to zone non-single family homes into this area. And, and in a way, by, by doing that, protected single family areas in the whole town from further 40B projects. So as we talked about 11 years ago, we've we proposed zoning a different type of housing here in South Berlin near 290. And I think this is another dimension of that. And um, I think it's going to be very attractive. And I think there are ways that we could provide some perspectives from, from the, the main rotary and from South Street and, and from further um, further south on River Road West, we can, we can do some perspective renderings that would show how these will appear as, as folks are driving through town. Tom, may I, may I speak, Mr. Chairman? Yes, you may. Uh, so as the new guy on planning, but certainly not new to this project from my uh, just being in town and being on the Conservation Commission. Um, uh, first, let me start with Matt and Chris, you guys, I think have been good neighbors um, and, you know, done help the town with our 40B levels and everything, but I really have to say how much I don't like this. <laughs> um, I hear from everybody how shocking it is the scale of the apartments that are there. Um, I don't, I don't feel like that I know anybody who would be in support of this. Um, just, there's so much building going on in Berlin. There's, it's been a, we've had a lot of stuff going on between Highland Commons and the solar farm and the apartments. Um, those trees aren't gonna really be screen, adequate screening for about 20 years. Uh, and I really don't want to be a bummer about it, but I'm, I'm having a hard, hard time with this. Um, even as Tom said at the last meeting and earlier tonight, um, the, the scale of what is going to be up against the road, you know, if, if again, years ago at town meeting, the project that was approved at town meeting has changed so dramatically from what we're actually seeing now. Um, and to have two story buildings or two and a half story buildings right up against the road isn't, I think if this project were presented at town meeting with nothing built, 
it would not pass. Um, kind of my two cents. A question about the um, affordability. We're, we're still proposing um, not to include any affordable units in the 29. Is that the plan? That was what I presented two weeks ago. And my suggestion on this was that we've gotten the town credit for 84 which when divided by 204 units is 41% of the dwellings that exist today are on the subsidized housing inventory list. If you absorb 29, you'd be dividing 84 into 233, which would be 36%. So still Riverbridge in totality, if none of these were affordable, would be providing 36% of the units as qualifying for the SHI list with the 21 actual affordable uh, apartments. So that's a, that's a position that makes sense to me, but I also know that the town has the inclusionary zoning bylaw and you have a general approach that any project of more than six homes or six or more would um, should have uh, some affordable units in it. The other point I made two weeks ago is that we would like to bring these units to market in the high 300s because I think there are there is a, a market for that price point. In fact, these these have a single car garage and um, are are designed to hit that part of the market. And when the developer, John, has to amortize um, the affordable, the lower um, revenues from the affordable units over the, the, the overall price goes up a bit. And also John can speak to this much better than I can, but with for sale product, it's often very hard to get qualified buyers, people who fit in this middle area where they have enough uh, assets and income to qualify, but, but not too much. And it can sometimes take a long time to get those sold or resold. But this is something that is a proposal that, that we've, we've suggested. And we, we certainly want to listen to, to the board's view on this. If, this is John, if I may add to that. Um, I have done a number of affordable um, developments and as Chris mentioned, the hardest part is getting the potential buyers to qualify. And um, I say this in a very respectful way because I don't have any issue with doing them. It was more, um, <clears throat> somebody may not have the credit because there's a misconception out there with some people that you know, you have to come in there, you know, there's anywhere from like two, two and a half percent down the payment is required. So someone would need that. It can come from a family member. There are some uh, restrictions on that. And on top of that, they have to have a good credit score and they have to have the income and a good paying job. And that has been very difficult. We had one <clears throat> that I just uh, completed and we had, um, I believe it was 12 affordable homes, single family homes that were selling at about 180 in the low 180s. And it, it took us over seven years, maybe eight years to um, sell them. We did another one in Shrewsbury over at the former Spags development. Uh, you know, we've done a number of them and it's very hard to get somebody you know, to <clears throat> meet all the qualifications, not necessarily the state. They meet the state qualifications, but it's meeting the financing qualifications that's been an issue. Haven't all the affordable units at uh, Mark Rhodes' development been sold? I thought he said he had been successful with those. Do you guys know? I'm not familiar with that development. 
Mark always seems to be fairly confident about his ability to move units. Now, w w earlier, and I don't know if you were in on that part of the conversation, Chris, but we talked about this consortium that's um, working with a number of towns in the area to help them with oversight of their affordable units. If, if, if the down payment and some other factors are key and the town is in a position where it has over half a million dollars in the hands of the housing partnership. Eloise is on here somewhere. I think she can tell us. Um, if, if the town were in a position to help um, in some of those instrumental costs initially, I wonder if we'd be in a position where we might find more uh, applicants that would qualify and, and be able to find their way forward, or whether it's just a long-term problem that they just never end up with the income that is necessary to, uh, to pay their way. Um, <clears throat> I, I certainly can't speak firsthand experience. I can only tell you what was told to me by lenders that were uh, talking to some of the affordable buyers, but you know, they have certain <clears throat> requirements that they have. <laughs> Excuse me, that they have that the um, money has to come from certain like relatives. As to whether it could come from the town, I can't speak for certainty whether it could, but I, I don't, it doesn't seem like it would be realistic based on what's happened in the past. And, um, you know, it, it has to do with financing guidelines. And to be quite honest with you, we try and stay out of that. We would hire you know, for, because there's so many rules with DHCD that we would hire like a specialist and they, we would have to pay for all like the, the marketing, they would advertise it in various newspapers, websites and so forth. We have lotteries, in fact, the one, it was in the town of Sutton, when we had those single family homes that it, it took so long to sell, we had to go back through another lottery because people hadn't qualified. And, you know, that's, it, there's there's a number of factors. I, I, I would suggest maybe we would talk about something like that, but I don't see it changing. Um, now, one of the things that I have seen is it does vary by town. Some people might find Berlin desirable than, say, another particular town. I, I don't know that for sure. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know what that does to the affordability factor. If I could comment on um, something Carolyn brought up, it, unless unless you'd like to have further conversation on the affordable, I just want to make sure I understand that the a lot of the credit we're getting for the existing apartments is because they're rentals, not because they're affordable. Is that right? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to answer that. If that's okay. Ch yeah. Chapter 40B has a bonus built into it that if towns zone in apartments uh, that are restricted to remain apartments and are restricted by a recorded regulatory agreement with regard to the actual affordable units, uh, the all of the apartments, 100% of the apartments that are part of an affordable housing apartment program are credited as, as being on your subsidized housing inventory. And that's because the legislators who adopted Chapter 40B recognize that apartments being built in towns that wouldn't ordinarily choose to, to encourage them are a form of a, affordable housing even those that are not leased at affordable rates. So this is actually built right into chapter 40B. And that's what we were looking at when we designed the, uh, the residential component. So I, I read somewhere that there was, you know, the 40B program hasn't gone exactly as originally intended. And there was some thought of 
removing that uh, provision. And if that were to happen, um, we would then have a number of affordable units in the current apartments. And then we would have this new development with none. Well, we wouldn't get any credit for the, whatever it is, 60 units or something that are rentals that are not affordable. With, with, with a regulatory agreement that's been signed by the town and the state and, and Riverbridge, and with, with this reflecting what's in the zoning bylaw, which, which it is, I don't know that any change in that statute would be retroactive to this project. There's a recorded regulatory agreement on the land records, which dictates exactly how this, this uh, the 84 units are to be handled. So if, if there's discussion of the legislature modifying that, I'm not sure that it would be retroactive to existing projects. Let's see. I just have one thing to say about the affordable component. Um, we have we have a bylaw with the requirement of a certain number of affordable units. I totally understand what you're saying about one project being over, um, but I think we need to seriously think about not uh requiring some level of affordables just because why did we allow it in one project and we won't allow it in another project i think that um i think it just sets a precedent that we might not want to do um, they are definitely two different projects one's townhomes for sale one's apartments um so that I don't, I don't know that that's a road we want to go down. I understand. That, that, um, that makes a lot of sense, Carolyn. If I could go back 11 years ago to the artwork we showed at the public forum in front of the planning board and then the public hearing and then at the town meeting, uh, we showed a lovely design that had residential units above retail, mm -hmm. the way organic main streets used to, used to develop decades and decades ago. And that was 11 years ago. And I did believe that we could find underwriters for that, banks that would lend us money to build that very nice looking traditional main street look. And then we didn't. Banks tend to want to lend money so that commercial can be built and they want to lend money so that residential can be built, but none of them want to build, they want to lend money so that a developer builds them both as part of the same structure. So the vertical mixed use was our concept and we did show this to the town 11 years ago and then we, we failed to be able to implement it because of those financing constraints. But I'm as disappointed as you are that we weren't able to do that. And actually in my office, I'm, I'm looking at the artwork you're probably remembering and many people remember. It's hanging on my wall in my office and it is very sweet. It's a very lovely form of, of development and it's something that in our childhoods we saw on main streets and we really wanted to bring that to, to River Road West. We just were not able to. And I think the biggest lesson I've learned throughout this project is that the market really dictates what we're actually able to do. I, I also wanna say that the zoning bylaw didn't require that. That was the artwork sure. that we showed and we showed it because we earnestly wanted to bring that image. Um, when we didn't, it didn't require an amendment to the zoning bylaw. It's just we didn't secure that financing to build that project. So I know others have spoken with me about this same feeling that you showed us one kind of 
aesthetic and elevation and artwork, and that's not what Riverbridge looks like. And I share that disappointment, but I also feel that we've brought a collection of uses that are healthy. The commercial is occupied. It's paying rent. It's vibrant commercial. I think it will all be a success. And the residential, you know, we did what we set out to do, which is zone in apartments. And I know that it's a big scale. That's seven large apartment buildings, although I think the way they've been placed has been very tasteful. Um, so I understand the disappointment, but we have worked as hard as we could to, to fulfill that initial vision and, and we just weren't able to, but we didn't uh, become discouraged. We just kept trying to figure out what will the market bring here. We also wanted a market. I can't tell you how many times in town I'm asked, can't you bring Trader Joe to lot 9B? I wish we could. That is a, a big traffic generator and we haven't generated as much traffic as, as we had planned to because we had planned to have a 25,000 square foot market. But Trader Joe won't come and we haven't been successful with other kinds of retail. The other thing I'll just say, this is not really so much a planning concern, but it's a concern to me as the president of the Riverbridge Association Inc., which is our not-for-profit owners association. We own this waterworks system, which is permitted by DEP and provides very clean and healthy water for the hotel and the apartments and everyone else. You know, we, we can't make that work without flushing enough toilets and without having enough water use. And retail uses very little water. And so we tried very hard to bring a major restaurant to Lot 9B, a 7,000 square foot destination type restaurant, not a chain, one of a kind that would have been great. That never did happen. We signed a lease and we were in, this, in the financing stages when the tenant pulled out. That would be a good water user. Restaurants use a lot of water. These townhomes would be a good water user. And so part of my motivation as the person responsible for making sure that our water district is, is in good shape, our water and sewer, is I'm hoping we would really like to find a good constructive use for lot 9B that is pleasing to the town, but also uses sufficient water to make the water district work. So again, that's not a planning concern. And we knew that the town didn't have public water and public sewer when we first bought the Reese family property. But one of the things that motivates me toward this proposal is that uh, this is a very, this would really complete the waterworks program. I know one of the proposals it, when, before you guys bought the property, the Reese family came, uh, I don't remember if they actually came to town meeting, I, but I remember seeing plans of several streets of single family homes and everybody um, was upset at the idea of that many new residences in town all at once. Um, which was why the developments were, you know, when John Deli first came and that, and then you guys, that's why these were even considered um, because people were not looking for this much residential to be brought into town. Um, and I just hear that reflected over and over. And I'm not, I completely understand from an economic standpoint and I, from, you know, Again, I've been on this journey with you guys, as has everybody else here. Um, so I understand how you got to this point. I'm just reflecting back to you what I'm hearing and what I see. Um, it's essential for us to hear that. John Deli Briscoli, who had the project, the, the property under contract for quite some time, did come to town meeting. He came to town meeting in 2004 with no residential. Uh, that was big box stores. 
and the town meeting rejected that plan. Yep. It, would have, it would have consumed 20 buildable acres that we've devoted to open space. Yep. It, spread, it spread the parking out very close to the Assabet River and we pulled it way back in tight to the, to the rotary. Um, he failed and then he listened some and he heard that a mixed use was more of interest. And so he came back in 2005 with a project that would have um, mixed some condominium units with retail. And I think right. the plan you may be the scale of. of The scale of his second project that was massive. And I think, again, that's what scared people away. Um, they didn't want a massive development. And there was a Dodson report. There was there, the town received some mitigation money from the Solomon Pond Mall, and hired a, a group called Dodson Associates that did a, a feasibility study and a master plan for South Berlin at the Rotary, and we looked at that report, and sure enough, it was a it called for a mix of uses, residential and commercial. And when we came to town meeting, first we failed in May of 2009, and then we succeeded in December. We showed a slide that was four images, the Dotson rendering of what Dotson was recommending the town should want, which was a mixed use village, the two Delhi Prescoli plans, which were nothing like that, and Riverbridge, which was bigger and more dense than the Dotson image or, or, or vision, but it was the same in nature. And I think that helped us eventually gain enough support to get the project approved. Again, it doesn't look like it did in the artwork, but it has work. There is a mixed use village here. It's got a, a small liquor store and a cafe and a gas station and a daycare center and a hotel. Each one of those projects took Matt and me a couple of years to put together and we hope we've brought good people that are a benefit to the town. But it, it, it's sort of market driven and there is a village here. It's been a long struggle and I do appreciate that we brought a lot of housing. I, I'm aware that the, the, the Rockwell introduces a lot of housing here. We have generated fewer school children than what was projected, which I know was a, a concern, especially some years ago. Um, so I understand that we're adding more residential in this proposal, and I understand the, the concern about that. But I'm also interested in a good constructive use of Lot 9B that I think together we could adjust it until it fits very nicely on this site and finishing up River Road West, uh, the east side of River Road West. And the tax revenues also would be a consideration. These townhomes would have a value, an, an obsessed value, appraised value of, of $10 million compared to about $3 million of retail if we could find retail there. And even if we account for the different mill rate, the $27 mill rate for commercial versus the $15 mill rate for residential, this would raise for the town about twice as many dollars in taxes every year. Now, I'm not a tax expert and that would, that would need to be run by um, the director of, of assessing in town, Molly Reed, and also the fiscal impact analysis that's underway but my back of the envelope calculation would indicate that this is a good use. A good use. It's a, it's, it will look, I think it will look very attractive. I don't think it will add lots of school children because these are small two bedroom units. They provide a different type of housing, which is for sale. And even those that are not affordable uh, fit an important need. They're a good water user for our water district and the tax revenues I think would would jump from about $80,000 a year to about $160,000 a year if we put the higher value product here. When you say higher value product, you mean higher end townhomes? I mean, if you compare the 
the assessed value of, of these 29 homes and the assessed value of the growing room daycare center and the cafe combined, which is about what you would put on lot 9B if you could find retail users. The one would have a, a value, you know, when we get our tax bills, yeah. the first thing they do is they show what is the value of the land and the buildings and the total, and mm -hmm. then they apply the mill rate. You know, you're really talking about a difference of 3 million to 10 million. Now, again, Molly Reed should check me on this carefully because I don't want any voters making a decision based on what I say would be the tax revenues. But as I look at it, these units at a value of $350,000 a piece would be about $10 million. And again, even the applying the lower mill rate, your revenues would be considerably higher. Again, not really a planning consideration, but a, but a part of the mix here. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here just for a second. So let's say, because another thing that I have been talking about um, in the couple of months I've been on the planning board is, you know, not necessarily affordable by the state standards, but affordable for Berlin. Um, you guys seem to have at least heard that and want to bring these units on in the high threes, low fours, which is still higher than what I would like to see, but I understand. What assurance are we able to get that when all is said and done and these are built and put on the market that they're not going to be 450, 475? be really sure is by the constraints that derive from size of unit, number of, of garage bays in a house, whether there's a first floor master bedroom, which tends to bring higher prices. John knows this much better than I do, but I think there isn't an assurance other than looking at the product, the floor plans and the product and consulting with people who can tell you where does that product fit in the in the marketplace. But I think these John John could tell you better than I can, these would fit in that in that tier, uh, not anywhere near what a single family home would cost in Berlin. Right, because we're de we definitely have we're looking to fill that that gap of you know everything that's being built in town and there are reasons for it and everything, but most of the new construction in town is three quarters of a million and up. Um, and people who raised their children here, their children can't afford to buy in town. Um, we're looking to fill that entry level or workforce housing, um, you know, market point um, for the town. Maybe you could comment a little bit about how, how do you evaluate what you're talking about putting here in terms of where it occupies in the, in the market? Thank you. Um, I was going to address it. I, Carolyn, again, you missed the last, um, you know, I'm sorry. I, I watched I, it this afternoon. I watched it this afternoon on YouTube. All right. <laughs> so good I'm up, to, for that I'm up one. to speed. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good. Um, so I've been doing this 37 years, and sometimes, you know, what it is is that the reason I think Berlin, the prices that you say are so high, is it's a desirable town. And, you know, people want to be there. And I think the land costs are high, and they, they don't really have much of an opportunity to build something less. And if you look at what they're building, you will see that this doesn't necessarily compare to it. And by that, what I mean is these are two bedrooms on the second floor. When you get a, um, I have to be careful with this comment, but when you get an older crowd, they want the, you know, the first floor master bedroom. And these are generally speaking people that have 
made some money on their existing home, you know, they may have bought it for 30 years ago for a lot less money and now they can afford to pay some of the high prices. Are you getting people that <clears throat> buying the single family homes, they couldn't afford towns that are, I don't want to pick on any towns, but say like, you know, Sudbury or whatever that are moving further west just to get something in three quarters of a million is a bargain compared to what you would pay in those towns. But looking at our product, we don't have any of that. With the two bedrooms up and with the one car garage, it restricts what we can get. Because generally speaking, people want a two car garage. And we've intentionally, you know, shortened the footprint on these here so that they're only about, uh, uh, I believe they're 26 feet wide. You know, <clears throat> if we could have gone with a 42 foot wide footprint, we would have. Um, gotten a two car garage and the prices would have been substantially more. But because of the type of unit that we're proposing, we can't get the kind of money that they're talking about there. But one thing I will say is that this was a year ago before the COVID pandemic hit. Um, we could probably say with reasonable surety that we could hold prices to a certain level. But, you know, there's situations this may floor you, I don't want to get way off line with this here, but appliances are very hard to get. Pressure oh, treatment. Yeah. Appliances. I mean, people yep. say, well, I go into Home Depot when I see them. It's like, well, try and buy them. Um, you know, we're, we're paying more, you know, just to get them. And we're paying more for everything you can think of, you know, to try and get them. Um, so that's the one thing that's you know like holding us back and that's also contributing to higher prices it's not as though developers are making more they're paying more and uh if the analogy works it's no different than if an incident happened around the world and all of a sudden you wake up tomorrow and gas prices went up 20 30 40 cents um well why did it happen they bought that gas a long time ago but they it goes up we we're hit with the same situation uh over the last six to seven months. So answer the question, our intent is to keep the prices down. We're going after a, um, a lower market. We're hoping that maybe even people in Berlin that some of their children can buy here. If you had asked me to talk, you know, be more specific in terms of the market, I think we're looking at people that are in their high 20s to low to mid 30s that we're looking at, you know, for buying these units here. That's the market we're going after. Right. Hopefully that addresses it. Yeah, no, I know that there's no way you can guarantee it. I just, it, from my perspective, I wanted you to hear what it is that I'm interested in seeing and why. Um. <clears throat> well, hopefully I gave you some assurances in that, that, you know, again, because of the home we're building, um, you know, for instance, in our other developments, our other townhomes that we've had to do because of COVID, one of the things we've had to do is put in home offices in there, you know, and that's gone over very, very well. And if you look at these flow plans, it's nearly impossible to put a, an office in this year because the footprint, they're only about 1,500 square feet. There's not a real right. place to put it. Yeah. Uh. As, as Chris said, I do think that we could make this palatable so that it looks good from the road. We could provide some treatments of those perspectives. I think that would be that would help be helpful. Certainly. You're gonna need it if you're gonna to go to the, you know, to the larger public and they're gonna to wanna to see what they're buying into. Should we go on to Chris's other agenda items? Sure. Do you need me for that? I think so, unless the board would like you to 
be here for that part too. This this is as much about our development agreement as it is about zoning. So um, I think I think we're all set unless the board feels differently. Um, I, I'm pretty, I think we're all set. The only comment I want to make is, is one consideration and maybe after your meeting with um, public safety, uh, you can get some more clarity. But if we were able to get a couple of affordable units and you were able to eliminate the little Bassett Road spur, slide that five building over, made it larger and got a couple of more units out of this that we could dedicate to affordable, I think that it would go a long way to solving a few problems with those type of things. So, cause it's a, it's a road to nowhere right now. Something to consider. If anybody else has, or if nobody else has anything, any of the board members have anything to say or further this, then I think we can pivot, Chris, to the other part. John, thank you for joining <laughs> us tonight. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. Good night. You're welcome. Good night. Well, thank you for the uh, the comments on the lot 9B plan. Tom, if I could just clarify your last comment so uh, I understand it. I, I hear that you're asking for some affordable units. Um, and, and I do I get that. Make it more palatable. Yeah. So and I was trying to figure out, I know you don't want to give up units that you have now. You've got 29 or whatever, 28 whatever you've proposed, and I get that. So I was trying to figure out while I was looking at the plan, okay, let's not take any away, but can we add some? And the only way you can add some is to make the density denser. And the only way you can do that is, is to create more space. And if you don't have the space to create, where do we go from there? And the only thing I could think of is, is that small, if you're gonna shut that road off anyways, it's a small little spur that's not gonna be much of it's not going to do anything other than splitting that that you know um, um, roadway or that parcel if that could if you could take that space slide that unit over there's actually even a small and i don't know it gets into your parking lot of the of the growing room so maybe you don't want to gain that over there but you could certainly slide that over and make that a six building uh six unit building there is some room up in that corner where the, there's like a small little triangle. Maybe there's a possibility of getting another unit in there. Um, so now we've created a couple of more units. Maybe that makes it more palatable to throw a couple of affordable units in there just to make it so it doesn't look like, you know, we're, we're not being sensitive to all the zoning that we've done, all the hard work that we've done and everything else. So just a thought. You may have fire department and police department say, no, 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 we don't want that. We need another access into this complex and, you know, that may be a moot point, but it's something to explore at least. Yeah. Um, I, I get it now. I think what you're saying is the little piece of Bassett Road that would remain, right. that would dead end at this, pro well, it would dead end, it would come to a T intersection with Newsom Road. Correct. You're saying because Newsom Road cuts all the way through, maybe you don't even need that little section. Exactly. I see. If you go out, you have to make a, a right hand turn anyways. But, right. It's not a very useful exit, no. actually. And if it's that short and it's not useful, then why even have it? All right. Just a thought. I, you don't know, it's a good thought. And, and also, when it comes to affordable housing, I don't know if you recall this, but I sat for many years on Westboro's housing partnership. I'm very devoted to affordable housing. It pains me to even recommend a new phase of Riverbridge without including some affordable units. I'm just listening to my contract purchaser and the economics and looking at what we did accomplish. And I therefore have, 
have made that proposal, but I hear you and I'm, I'm simpatico with you. I, yeah. I get it, some affordable for sale. I've never tried to market them, so I don't know how difficult that is, but I do understand. There's gotta be a way. I, just, you know, and, and if it gets, if it's more units that make that happen, okay, so be it. All right, well, that's a very good suggestion. I, so, I appreciate that. Yep, no problem. Um, now, of all the, the items on our list that was circulated, I'm assuming that a two page document that I gave to Margaret has been circulated on one page. It had what I called benefits of River Bridge, and it just recited some of the things we have done and and would like to do to to wrap up the development phase. And on the second page, it had six asks. So I'm assuming people have seen that, and that was my intention in sending it to Margaret. I wanted everyone to be able to see this. It's it's a wish list, and it's it's been thoughtfully put together, but we also want to listen. Um, of all the items on, on the six point wish list, this rezone of lot 9B is the most important one. And I realize how little time we have if we're gonna get, if we, if we can accomplish this, we want John to be in the ground at the start of the building season, which means we really only have one shot, which is the December 5th town meeting, unless that date slides, but Margaret seemed to think that was going to hold, which would mean that if we're going to move in this direction, we would need to figure out when to hold a planning board public hearing, because as you know, you can't bring a warrant article to town meeting floor that calls for a change in the zoning bylaws unless the planning board has, has held a, meeting, a public hearing and made some kind of recommendation to the town meeting. So I just first wanted to, before I get into the other aspects of our wish list, I wanted to ask your thoughts about, could we target a planning board public hearing in the middle of November and see if we can work toward that? Um, or does that the, not seem possible? So. I was looking at the calendar earlier and the we meet on the 10th. Um, we normally wouldn't meet again that month, but I, I wondered because we're going to have other articles on the warrant, whether we want to schedule a hearing uh, and only a hearing for the 17th. Um, that gives us next week to square away language so we could put it in the paper the following week um, to meet the deadline for that Friday and the following Friday to post the hearing. Otherwise, we'd have to have language in, in an agreement essentially by, uh, well, I mean, the, before we'd meet ever again, so. I, I could have a warrant article language that would accomplish this by Monday of next week for you to look at. And I would go through the overlay zoning bylaw and look carefully at what I think would need to be modified. And I could write that up for you very quickly. Um, and the 17th was the day I, I thought about when I looked at the calendar, it seems to be just about the best spot to give us enough time to prepare it um, and enough time before the town meeting itself. So language be given and circulated around by next Monday and then we would discuss it on the 27th and hold the hearing on the 17th is that what you're saying that that's a good program yes so for tim your your suggestion is is that we hold two meetings in november well i mean we already could, have the 10th on the calendar right i mean you could scratch the 10th move everything to the 17th and have a 
planning board meeting and the hearing on the 17th and not do anything on the 10th. There's, if a, lot you or... There's a lot of heavy lifting between now and then. The, uh, it would have to be posted on the 6th and the 30th, mm -hmm. which means... The 6th and 30th, yep. It would have to be delivered to the item on the... Really on the 27th, before we'd meet again. Um, I don't think I can give it to them on the 28th. I can check that. Um, if they'll take it on the 28th, then we could, you know, settle things up on the 27th. I think we need to know that. Because I think they're going to say they want it on the 27th. 6th to 13th. It's going to be two consecutive weeks. The first, at least 14 days prior. Oh, 14 days prior. So that wouldn't work. I don't think it makes sense to jump to the 24th for the hearing. I think that's too close to Thanksgiving, but. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily have to hold it on a Tuesday. I mean, you could look at something like the 19th um what does that gain us it's since the item's only coming out on a friday i mean it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't help us still need to, yeah it, it would be the 20th yeah you'd have to jump you know so if it helps i could get the language to you by friday of this week well our, our difficulty is we're we don't have a scheduled meeting until uh, the 27th. 27th, yeah. yeah. Um, we, could, we could move our meeting from the 27th to the 20th. Um, That's a possibility. Um, I don't I know what to, but I can move it around. Yeah, we. Tom, I mean, we still but this is there. Leanne, Tom. I hate to interrupt, but I'm I'm just not sure that there would be a Zoom channel available that night. I know okay. Board of Health meets. I'm not sure if there's any other board that already has a meeting booked. Yep. Right. Thank you. Um, So, I mean, we can, we can certainly take language for a proposed article. I mean, it, if, if it's a citizen's petition, <laughs> uh, then it goes in as, as written. And, uh, and we set our hearing date for the 17th and, uh, we move forward with the, you know, the articles that we've discussed for having on the warrant, and we've got the language for those already. So those are that's no problem. And um, we take Chris's proposed language and and submit it, um, and then we meet on the twenty seventh and and uh, get a chance to review it and. Is you know if there's major issues, then it can be amended on the floor. Certainly, I don't think. I mean, Chris's habit is to write stuff that's pretty tight and succinct, and and he's going to try to develop language that addresses the issues that he wants addressed. So, um, I think that's our best bet. Then we just follow along on that schedule. So we have a hearing on the 17th. Um, that gives Chris time beyond just next Monday, certainly, um, 
to get some text ready. Um, we need just need to make sure I can submit it to the paper on the 26th to 27th, and I'll talk to them about what option we want to use. I mean, I for one would, even if it's a draft, the faster we can get it, the faster we can start digesting it and understanding it. I know it'll be sustained, succinct as best as it can be, because that's the only way it's going to get, it can't be very complicated of people who are just going to roll over and say, forget it. Um, but even so, I think I would like to see it as soon as possible, you know, Monday for sure. Now, draft. Let me, let me throw out another option, um, <laughs> which with cheap, I'm cheap. Um, if we don't use the item, but we use the telegram and we don't have to meet the 30th, but we need to meet the second deadline in the newspaper, then, uh, we could review it on the 27th and submit it to the telegram. You know, I can check with them tomorrow. Um, we can submit it to them on the 28th for inclusion in the newspaper on, on uh, November 2nd. That still meets the requirement of 14 days prior. We could also publish it in the item even if we can qualify uh, with the requirements of the statute with the telegram it can it can still nonetheless be be in the item so more p people who read that will see it yeah i mean actually in terms of circulation it it, it used to be that we use the item because it was included in the telegram and people saw it if they got the telegram and they might subscribe to the item as well but uh I don't know if that's the case anymore. I, people, I don't know what the circulation of the item is in town. It, I don't know what circulation of any newspaper is in town. <laughs> so, less and less. Using newspapers to spread the word probably is pretty archaic when you think about it. People read it at the store, but they don't buy it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the front page. But that's the other option. I mean, we'd, we'd pay a little more, but it's not like we don't have uh, some money in the budget for printing, so, and expenses. Is that, that, the, is that, that the only, um, for this, is that the only one that you're going to request, Chris, or do you wanna see if you can loop in some of the other ones? We don't need to have any other zoning article. Uh, the only, the only other zoning article was the drive up windows. And I think we can leave that to the annual spring meeting. And the other items are really probably the, better. Yeah. The, the other items are really the development agreement, right? So which doesn't need a public hearing and, right. and only needs a, a 50% vote, not the two thirds. So I think we could limit this to uh, the zoning side to only this this article okay so i'll call the telegram tomorrow and uh clarify can you when you get your information can you circulate that by email to the rest of us i don't know if i'll have time okay <laughs> uh, tim immediately you immediately i will yes <laughs> Uh, this this will be a citizen's petition, which means Matt and I will be collecting, is it 200 signatures? For a special. Eloise, are you there? Leanne, can you give Eloise permission to speak? <laughs> yes, I will unmute her. Hold on. I think she's still there. She is. Hang on. She probably wants to talk to us. Go ahead, Eloise. You should be able to oh, unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there she goes. Greetings. Hello, Eloise. Long time no talk. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Selectman opened up the warrant tonight, so that means you need 100. 100 is to force the Selectman to call a town meeting, but since it's 
town meeting has been called. You now only need 100 to get something on the warrant. And Eloise, do you know how long the warrant will remain open? Yeah, I thought she said something like November 2. I can confirm that tomorrow and try to remember to send you an email. Okay, thank you. So this would be a hundred, this would be a citizen's petition that we would circulate and get a hundred or more signatures. And then we need to make sure we get the warrant article uh, into the selectmen during the window that the warrant is open. Correct. And please, as soon as you get them, start su submitting them to me. So, because uh, I have to certify that who's ever signing this is an actual voter. Yes. Yes. I know you need time to, to confirm. All right. I think I understand. And you'll have this draft by Friday. So we, you can start to, to, to think about the way I'm framing it or make, make suggestions if you have them. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you. You've given us a lot of time and I don't want to take too much more of your time on non planning board items, but we have launched this two page document. Just, just to let you know, you know, Matt and I really do view what we're trying to do between these two town meetings is really finish up the development side of River Bridge. And our development agreement has a number of aspects to it that we need to focus on and pay attention to. We have been working with Margaret on that she did a careful analysis of the development agreement and the two modifications of that agreement. So I think we have a pretty good handle on that. You know that we have an obligation in the development agreement to pay the town $500,000 mitigation for public safety. And that is $100,000 per year for five years, commencing with a, the completion of a certain percentage of of square footage that's been given a CO. And we've reached that and that first payment is due November 1st of this year. We're not gonna make that payment. We don't have the funds. Um, our proposal is that we pay the whole thing when we sell lot 9B um, and accelerate those payments and take care of them all at once. And another part of our proposal is, is this payment to the town so that it can, can conduct a full design and feasibility study for an eventual replacement of, of the bridge over Northbrook. Both of those sums of money would come out of the closing proceeds. And the reason we suggest this is that we really don't have any other source each year for those funds. This has cost so much and taken so long that what we own, what we will still own when this is completed, we don't own any interest in the apartments, we won't own any interest in the townhomes if, if those are approved. We own a 40% interest in the hotel and the daycare center building, the gas station building and the cafe. These all have debt on them. We're servicing the debt. Um, it will take years before that set of holdings can throw off an extra $100,000 a year. So our proposal to the town is that we, we take care of that obligation all at once. Sometimes when you pay a sum of money that was supposed to come in over a period of time, you can reduce it to what's known as the, the net present value of that series of payments with interest rates being so low, that wouldn't be much of a discount, but it might be, you know, 475,000 instead of 500,000. But we propose to do that all at once if we're able to get this rezone and we close on the sale, we would do that all at once. In terms of our other asks, eventually, we'd like to take another try at two drive up windows, one for the cafe, and one for the, uh, the gas station. Um, when, 
when we designed the Village Cafe building, we, we had a warrant article pending and we hoped it would go through, but that drive up window is there and is just sitting there and we would like to, to see if we can win enough votes at a town meeting to, to get that approved. But again, we're not gonna try that this winter, that would be in the spring. We, we would like to take another try at, at a, liquor, a full liquor license. As you know, we sold the full license to someone who wanted to take it up to Highland Commons. Uh, it never really went there. Those funds were all put into the waterworks to help us complete that. I think it would make the Village Cafe a more valuable building. If that building, which we do own, had a drive up window and a full liquor license in the, in the wine and beer store, it would do much better and it would be worth more and the taxes would be higher. Um, so at some point in the spring, we may come back and ask the voters to consider making those enhancements. Um, as you know, we, we've helped the town commission an update to the fiscal impact study. So going back 11 years ago, when we brought the Riverbridge proposal to town meeting, we had a fiscal impact analysis done which basically said that the commercial is, is a net positive to the town, the residential is a net negative, and the senior, ho the senior housing is, is positive because there aren't a lot of municipal services that come out of senior housing. The residential is a negative because, um, because of the school impact and other municipal costs, and the commercial is sort of break even. And when you mixed all of that together, Riverbridge was net positive, but that was because we had the senior component. And if you remove that senior component, we would go $51,200 negative. And that's where that extra tax that is in our development agreement came from. It came from an understanding that if we didn't build a senior component at Riverbridge, we would be net negative to the town in terms of considering all municipal costs of our project and all tax revenues and other revenues. And the reason we are commissioning with the selectmen's uh, support, a new fiscal impact analysis is that we don't think we're really anywhere near net negative. We think Riverbridge is uh, considerably positive financially uh, the apartments are not generating the, the school demand that was initially expected. The values of the hotel and the apartments are higher than we anticipated. And we have commissioned the same company that did the original study and did the update in 2013 to do an update. If we are correct, and, it's, and we didn't know we would, we would attract a hotel which pays a 6.25% uh, room tax directly to the town. So if we are correct when that study is completed, we will be asking as part of modifications of the development agreement to be released from that extra tax. Uh, looking at where it had originated and looking at the fact that if this report reveals that we are considerably positive, we would ask to be released from that obligation. Uh, with road improvements, you know that the development agreement required us to uh, widen the deck on Northbrook, which is not replacing the bridge, but it's just taking it off the two outer beams, putting a larger beam on and widening it by I think two feet on either side, building a pedestrian bridge separate from that bridge so that walking across Northbrook uh, would be less dangerous. And we were to make, we were to put the, the new roundabout in, which we've done, and widen River Road West, which we've done, and make some improvements to the main rotary, which we've done. There were also some relatively minor improvements at two other intersections in town. Our proposal as part of this exit strategy is to provide this $150,000 to fund the eventual replacement of Northbrook by a more modern bridge that would include a pedestrian uh, section. Um, and, and 
have that considered satisfaction of um, all of those road improvements. So that's part of the ask. And the final thing is that because we don't have a senior component, we would ask to be relieved of the obligation of providing uh, an ambulance service uh, that would be under contract with Riverbridge. Um, so those are, those are the asks. As I said, by far the most important one to us is, the, is considering the rezone of Lot 9B to allow these townhomes. Um, also, we, in terms of the, the first page of our document, which talks about benefits, we have built a canoe launch down at the Assabet River with the approval of the Conservation Commission. In the meantime, the town purchased what we call the Reese Meadow, the 12.5 acre meadow that's across from Spooky World. And we're offering to deed an easement to the town so that if the town ever builds a road or some parking down near the, near the river on that meadow, you would have access to, uh, to the Assabet River. Um, so those, those are the, you know, the, the benefits that I've already talked about, the, the fact that we did keep our number one promise to the town, which was to, to get the town credit for the affordable housing units, the 84 units. Um, you know, we think on balance, what we're asking is reasonable and it, it's what we think would help us bring the development part of this project to a close. Again, we're not going anywhere. We want to be part of the community for a long time, but we wanted you to be aware of, of this set of asks. Most of it will probably get deferred to the uh, spring town meeting. Um, in fact, it's possible the only Warren article we'll have for winter in December would be would be the rezone for lot 9B. But we're sharing this, you know, it's a little bit nerve wracking to write down on two pieces of paper exactly what we imagine would be a good resolution to all of all of the different obligations and, and benefits. But we did that because we want to encourage people to ask us questions and talk with us about this overall exiting from, from that developer role. Thank you. Comments from the board members? I said pretty much all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything more at this point. So I guess we'll look forward to the language of your uh, proposal. Bye. Um, end of this week, first part of next week, so we can start chewing on that. And uh, so do you want to be put on the agenda for our next meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes, what please. Works well for you. 745 or, or eight. Why don't we make it 745? Cause I think this will be, you know, pretty lengthy discussion. So it will give us a chance to check in, go through any of the little housekeeping stuff we have, and then we can dedicate most of the meeting to you. That would be great. Okay. So by, I'm going to try to do this by, by Friday to get you the draft of warrant language. And then we'll work on the plan. We'll continue to analyze it. I will get to work tomorrow with Waterman Design on creating some perspective views okay. that can take you from the roundabout into, into the east side to see what it looks, out, looks like from, from street level and maybe the rotary and maybe a third vantage point so that you'll see how, how will this impact as, you know, we know that Riverbridge is the gateway to, to the right. town and it's important how it looks and, and how it feels. Right. So, so we'll work on that. Um, and we've, and done hopefully a good job. we've done a good job of what we got, you know, right now. I mean, <laughs> the scale and everything else doesn't bother me. I've ridden by there a bunch of times and looked from different perspectives and I, I don't, it's not like it's massive and sticking up, which was what my big fear was when, when we first permitted it. Yeah. Um, 
But now with this last little bit, I just want to make sure that we don't screw it all up. <laughs> I do too. I do too. And Matt, and Matt does too. We we want we will know, screw it up. Yeah, we, we want the town of Berlin to feel that the Sennies were a good thing that happened to the town. You know, we okay. certainly have worked it every day since December second, two thousand nine. And, you know, we're not professional developers and other people might have done this much better or much quicker, but we've really worked it very hard and we've tried to make it a success and it's going, it's going to have been a success. It's just been long, long in, in getting here, but I think it's going to have been a success and we want you to, we want members of the community to feel that way too. Sure. Okay, so 745 on 1027. Okay. Thank you very much for all your comments. Thank you all. Good night. So that, that basically is all the hit lists on our agenda because we did the affordable um, main, uh, monitoring services discussion earlier. So if anybody has anything else that they want to bring up at this time or- I only have one thing. Yes. Um, is this new or is this a continuation of the discussion? It is not a continuation of the okay. so tonight's do, do discussion. We finish, is there any more or are we kind of so I'll call the papers, figure out whether we're able to do an item on Wednesday, the 28th, or whether we need to submit it before that, in which case um, we'll use the option of going with the telegram on the second, if that's possible, and then we can have another discussion and a, and a I mean, we've already voted on the other articles to submit them to the town meeting, so we're square on those. We haven't. Right. This is a citizen petition, so technically, if right. it's submitted to the selectmen, all we've got to do is have a hearing. Right. So I, I make a motion that we have a public hearing on November 17th at 8 o'clock um, via a Zoom. Second. Any further discussion? No. Okay. Should be fun. Should be fun. What's the date again, Tim? Sorry, I'm trying to 17th. write it down. 17th. 17th of November. What do you want to call it for eight o'clock? Yeah. Is this to review warrant articles or just what's, what is it? So we, we have to hold a public hearing um, prior to any town meeting in which there's zoning articles on the warrant. If we don't hold a public hearing, then they can't have a, and we don't give a report, they, they can't act on those. Yeah. Um, there's, there's ways in which a period of time can pass without our holding a public hearing and then they can be acted on. I, I guess that's my recollection, but essentially we have to have a hearing and we have to present a report on our vote at that hearing, uh, from that hearing to the town meeting. Mm -hmm. on any zoning articles. And there's the that other cluster of articles that, uh, you know, some we, we've eliminated some like the a and I mean the ARC zoning stuff and some of those. We talked about that the other day. Yeah, so. we'll let those go to the spring. Um, but those, the language is set, you know, we're, we're in good shape, so. Okay, so does that finish this discussion with our friends from South Berlin? No more? At least for right. tonight. At least for tonight, right. Yep. Okay, so you have some new business <laughs> for a timely discussion? Uh, so conservation is, has put together a wetlands bylaw uh, it's completely different than the last one. And um, it will be for the spring town meeting at this point. There's just not enough time to pull it together for a fall or December even. Um, 
So there's not really any rush. I will forward the um, draft document to each of you for your review. But um, at some point, uh, John Amy, who is the chair, um, and I would like to just get input from you guys um, concerning the document. So, okay. and at this point, I don't know if you want to wait until all the river bridge stuff is over or if you want to do it, in, you know, at a, at a meeting sooner than later. Uh, you tell me what you how you guys, how you want to do it. Well, we wouldn't have it before Dece our December meeting anyways. So maybe we'll do it right after the first of the year, one of our first meetings. Okay. Um, in the meantime, you know, like I said, I'll send, I'll send the document right now. Um, if there's anything that you, that is concerning or, or anything, um, we can definitely discuss it. Okay. Uh, not as a board, but as just citizens, if that's easier or whatever. But I just wanted to let you know that that's what's going on. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. I discovered that we have turtles to protect. We have a lot to protect. <laughs> the Blanding's turtles or- Turtles behind my house, right in the center of town. There must be a thousand of them in that little pond. <laughs> what kind are they? they? A butter. Well, there's a few, two snappers that are huge, and the rest are all just whatever you call them. <clears throat> she, she feeds them. You know, she just turtles. Hot, she feeds them hot dogs. She calls them. They all come running over to the uh, shore and eat hot dogs. Oh, that's so funny. It sounds like an invasive species to me. I think you can eliminate them. <laughs> the hot dog the snappers are <laughs> the hot dog eating turtles in the middle of an urban setting. No. <laughs> well, and you know that's like call a, them rats. That's like a uh, amphibious storm, rat stormwater runoff pond or something, and it was been so dry it almost dried up. All those poor <laughs> turtles would have been homeless. That's not spring fed. No, I don't think so. I think it all comes off the road. Are we talking about hot suns or what? Uh, between the Dion's and, and the house I bought, the Munions. You know oh, I mean? over there. Yeah. There's okay. that little pond in there, the town I made. Think that's Off of South Street. It's Linden. The one on the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Linden, and, and, yeah. Linden and South. Well, I yeah. happen to have the Mass GIS Oliver open as we speak. Well, the town created that pond with the drainage pipe off of Linden Street. Oh, well, it now but has now it's full of turtles we have to protect. Hmm. What? That pond's only, been... only if they're painted or Blanding's turtles. So, <laughs> really? Yeah. They're hot dog eating turtles. There's yeah. no protection for them. <laughs> so, the, the town, that, that, it's been there 70 years anyway. So what are you saying? It, it, it was drainage that was created back in the 40s or 30s that I think created so. that puddle? I huh. think so. I don't think there was water there before. I mean, I, you no, think I wasn't that? around. Tell, tell me why you think that. Somebody who yeah. <laughs> was around back then, which was probably Skip Sawyer, I think might have told me that. OK. Huh. Because it's definitely part of the larger wetlands pond system. Right. Oh, yeah. So it may have been kind of swampy and they enlarged it for that. Maybe. Because um, there's no like stream running into it. It's just run off from the road. Right. But there's all kinds of underground water happening all around um the center of town is that right huh? it's pretty wet yeah so i had an interesting uh tim you'd be interested in this i was talking to a guy who is working on the rail trail in another town nearby and in contrast to the five million dollars per mile that did you guys read the uh 
report of the Rail Trail Committee that was that Margaret sent us a few last week, two weeks ago. Well, anyways, it was a very good report, but basically what it said was that certain towns nearby, I think Acton maybe and some others were, even though the estimate was a million dollars per mile, that they were spending $5 million per mile <laughs> to build a trail trail. In a certain town nearby who has actively been building out the real trail there, several miles of it so far, the last mile they did cost 180000 so it was a hundred and was split mostly state and a little bit of town. Town put up like 50K. That's a big difference, 180K to 5 million. Yeah, huge. Because yeah. I was thinking about your suggestion the other day, Tim, which is tremendous. I think we could, if Hudson decided to do their part of the, even if they didn't, we, if we could run the, trail through the basically, you know, you run through woods with only one of butter to get to the town center. And then you get down Linden Street and you get on the aqueduct. What a great solution to the rail trail problem, but not at $5 million a mile. Right. I mean, you're required to pay prevailing wage, which is more than double what people, private contractors pay their workers. Does that make if, sense? If, if you take the state's share, is that the clicker if 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 we take the state share then we have to pay prevailing wage i believe so i, I mean I, I that makes sense but i, I have no idea but, but are, are there alternatives to um that funding I, source where we I, reduce the... i would i would i would double check that because i think if you're a right. municipality you don't have a choice i think, I think, think if the project's the over a certain dollar amount mm -mm. didn't we didn't we run into that with the 1870 town hall yeah with the elevator right? and it was about it was about the a dollar amount of the job yeah the 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 size of the job kicked in all of these other regulations oh that's interesting yeah. well i mean this guy i talked to does is volunteer there's a bunch of volunteers he does all the engineering work for him right you know all the cut and fill calculations and all that stuff but i'm sure they don't they're not doing a lot of road crossings. I mean, if you look at the requirements, you know, it's, it's, pa <clears throat> it's paved and the road crossings are elaborate and there's signals and all this other stuff. Yeah, I, so why, I've heard people say that, but I've also been on rail trails further out west that are like crushed stone. Exactly, that's the way the $180,000 one is. Right, so Which why do we have to have it paved? See, maybe the, what I'm thinking is maybe there's an option. You can either do it the state way and spend $5 million a mile, or you can do it in another way that's much more affordable, and maybe it's just not the same quality. And there, there's probably more maintenance, right? If it's crushed stone, there's more maintenance. Yeah, probably. But uh, still, for that amount of money, you know, yeah. <laughs> adding more you stone know, and gray once in a while. We're more rural anyway. I would that's prefer right. it to be less invasive and less... We don't want pavement. Plus... The horses don't want to walk on pavement. Right. Um, I don't know why a... I can't find this document. I don't know how we would get that restarted, but at some point it might be worth doing it. I believe the state is going forward with the rail trail from what I've heard. Well, if if the town needs to contribute a significant amount of $5 million per mile, I don't think it's going to go through mm. Berlin. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah, I don't. Um, so so one take of, us to one get a hundred thousand for a, a playground, right? <laughs> uh, one of the other conservation board commission members has been attending meetings about it and everything. And from, oh, sorry. Uh, Governor Baker is pretty pro rail trail, and mm. is doing a lot to forward, uh, further that. Yeah. So, oh, oh, here, I found it. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I don't know what, I don't, I haven't been paying that much attention to <clears throat> the financing of it just because there's so many different conflicting things that I've heard. Everything from, you know, 
$200,000 a mile to 5 million. Um, now, see, in Berlin, uniquely, we have, I think, one out of every three households has either an excavator or a dump truck in the backyard. Right. If we, we all chip just, in, we, we could, could probably knock it off. Yeah, we weekend. Easy. Let's go. <laughs> Building trails, we're good at that. Right. So we run into a turtle. Give me a marbled salamander and and <laughs> you go down the list of approvals different. that you that you need and each approval you have to hire a consultant to do a study and write a report. I mean, no wonder it's five million dollars. What do you now. oh yeah. I think, but again, see, I think there's all, all of that stuff is mapped. Potential um, endangered species habitat and everything. If your project is going through any of that, that's one thing. But if it's not. Um, I can't imagine the railroad protected species way back when, when they laid all the beds. Correct. Uh, like, so I know the area up on Peach Hill Road, um, up by Mark's little street up there that he's putting in, that area is definitely designated potential habitat for endangered species. Really? Um, yep. So and, did he and to again, open up a zoo or what, how did he get, how did he? No, I, he, um, I, I just, it's, there was a filing with the state with uh, natural heritage and endangered species. It's NHES, I think, hmm. um, of exactly where the project was going to be and just had to get something back from them saying um, that, yeah, no, he's good. Huh. If they're um, actually down um at the Reese meadow that we were just talking about there was also that also needed to be signed off because that's also area uh potential um endangered species habitat over there too um, but again it's all mapped and relatively easy to find out if at least there's the potential All right, I am sending the wetlands by law. Keeping any endangered species up there at the farm, Tim? No, they, <laughs> no, they're not, no. <laughs> Just farmers. Yeah, right? Um, yeah, so. Down in the 60s and 50s. Jay. Yeah. Um, you might actually like this website. I don't know if any of you guys have ever played on the Mass GIS. Mass oh yeah, Oliver. I use that all the time. Yeah. Oliver, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, so not hundred percent accurate though. I've noticed. No, it's not. Yeah. Um, even with the wetlands and stuff, it but it's all general. It gives you general areas. Um, but you can click layers on and off and. Right. Yeah, I noticed some of the conservation lands is not quite right. Yep. But it's still, it's, it's a good tool. It is. Yeah. That and Google Maps. It's amazing how rapidly Google Maps has been updating now. It's like every year or something. Oh, really? Yeah. Maybe less than a year. Wait till it's live. How's that going to be? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> One year, the map of my house was I was mowing my lawn. And yeah, <laughs> you could see me out there on the John Deere. <laughs> the the recent one that just came down for us, we it was right at the end of one of our horse shows. So it's all 
horse trailers all over the place and everything. And then a couple of days ago, it just disappeared. Yeah. If you save them, you can kind of follow the evolution of your property. Yeah. If you're working on it. You want a motion to adjourn? I'll entertain it. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Any further discussions? Exactly at 10 o'clock. Hearing none. Roll call vote, unfortunately. <laughs> so, Jay Teach. Aye. Timothy Wheeler. Aye. Carolyn McDonald. Aye. Tom Sanford, aye. Okay, we voted to adjourn. <laughs>